So this is the first lecture in the series on NET physics and we'll start with the chapter number one which is measurements. So let's start with the first topic which is of physical quantities. These are the quantities that are measurable quantities and the laws of physics can be expressed in terms of these quantities. Now, these physical quantities can be divided into a group of two. One of them is base quantities, and these are the quantities that cannot be expressed in terms of any other quantities. And then we have derived quantities, and those are the ones that can be expressed in terms of other quantities, such as the base quantities. Now, these are some of the base quantities, length, mass, and time. And these are their SI units, written as base units. And here are some of the derived quantities. And with them, these are their SI units, written in terms or derived from these base quantities, meters, kilograms, and seconds. You can see that the derived units can also be derived from the derived quantities as well such as force that is written with meters per second square, which is just the SI unit for another derived quantity, which is acceleration. Now, moving on to the next topic of scientific notation. So the scientific notation is the standard to express any number in terms of power of 10, such as 10 raised to power x, and also there should always be a non-zero digit to the left of the decimal in the scientific notation. Now these over here are some of the standard prefixes for the power of 10 with their symbols and their uh, powers of 10 expressed like this. We have kilo, giga, pico, nano, and femto, which are over here. Now moving on to the topic of error, it is simply the difference between the standard value and the experimental value measured. Now errors are also further classified into two groups. The first one we have assignable errors. Now the assignable errors are the ones to which we can assign a cause to and they'll always or usually follow the same trend of variations. So a cause can be assigned to these type of errors. Next, we have unassignable errors. And these unassignable errors are of the type to which we can't assign a cause because they do not follow a particular or any trend whatsoever. So these are the errors that are due to any unknown cause. Now the cure for the assignable errors is that these errors can be controlled experimentally while carefully monitoring any measurement process. And for the unassignable errors, the cure does not come from uh, controlling experimentally as these errors cannot be controlled experimentally. However, you can use a tool from statistics and take average of several of these values and then you can minimize the unassignable errors. Moving on to the topic of significant figures. So uncertainty in our measurements will lead us to establish some sort of a standard way to write the numerical value of a measurement and this numerical value is known as a significant figure. Now in any measurement, all of the accurately known digits and the first doubtful digit is termed as significant figures. Moreover, the greater the significant figure you have in your measurement, the more the accurate that measurement is. Now let's discuss some of the rules for significant figures that is that if you want to determine significant figures in a number you're going to follow some 
rules, which are number one, that all of the non-zero digits that you have in your measurement are known as the significant figures. For example, look at this number 3.456. This would have one, two, three, four, four significant figures, while the second number one, 12.3456 has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 6 significant figures. Secondly, any zeros that you have between your non-zero digits, they are also significant. For example, look at this number 2306. It has a zero in between these significant figures. So it has in total four significant figures. And likewise, 200894, it has two significant figures in between your significant figures it has two zeros between your significant figures and therefore it has in total six significant figures thirdly any zeros that are locating the position of the decimal in the numbers that are of have magnitude less than one are not significant hence in this example you have this number 0 0.000458 in this example or this number, these zeros are not significant. Point number four, the zeros that you have to the right of the decimal point, they are always significant. So for example, if you look at this number 3.0000, you have four zeros after this decimal point. Hence, this number has four significant zeros. And the last and final rule for significant figures is that the zeros that locate the decimal point in any numbers which are greater than one, they are not significant figures. For example, if you look at this number 30000, there are only one significant figure in this number. And if you look at this number 1400, there are only two uh, significant figures in this number. Now let's look at some of the algebra that you can do with significant figures. First, let's look at division and multiplication. Now suppose you have to compute the following. Once you do, you get this rather long answer which can be reduced to this short answer with just three digits over here. Just a little side note over here that any factor that has the smallest number of significant figures for it, it is called or known as the least accurate factor. Moving on to addition and subtraction form of algebra. You're only required to have the least number of decimal places so that's what you look for while counting the number of significant figures is not required for addition and subtraction for example suppose you are uh, required to compute this sum this sum gives you this result 27.855 however on this side we have this number with the least number of decimal places, which is 2, and hence we can have the final answer written in two decimal places, so we have 27.86. Now let's discuss rounding off your data. To do so, we have to again consider a set of rules for rounding off your data. So the first rule is that if your digit that has to be dropped and it is greater than 5, then simply add 1 to the previous digit or the last digit that has to be retained or that which stays and then drop everything uh, or all the digits that are further to the right of the number. For example, if you look at this number 3.677 and the digit to drop is 7, so let's see that the digit before that 7 is, it is 7 and so the digit 7 itself, the last digit, it is greater than 5, right? So we can add 1 to the second last digit, which is 7, which becomes 8, and then we can drop the further, uh, the rightmost 7, and therefore you have 3.68. 
Rule number two is that if you're a digit that has to be dropped and it is less than five, then simply drop it without adding any number to the last digit. So in this example, if you have 6.632 and the last digit that has to be dropped, it's two, which is less than five. So we can just drop it and we have 6.63 as our final answer. Rule number third is that if the digit that has to be dropped and it is exactly equal to five, then you have two cases. The first case is that if you have to retain an even number, then you simply drop the five. For example, if you look at this number 6.65, the number to retain is six and which is an even number. So we can simply drop the five and we have 6.6. .6. And for the case of odd, if you have to retain an odd number, then you just add one to it. So if you look at this example, we have the number 6.35 and the number to retain is three. So we just simply add one to three and we have 6.4. Now let's move on to the topic of precision and accuracy. So let's first talk about precision. So the precision of our, our instrument, it is determined by the least count of the instrument or the device that you're using to perform the measurement. And the smaller the least count of the instrument means more the precise is your instrument. Moving on to accuracy. The accuracy of a measurement depends on the fractional uncertainty in your measurement or the percentage uncertainty in the measurement. Moreover, the smaller the percentage error is, the more accurate your measurement is. Just a tip over here that if you count more number of readings, then you can reduce the uncertainty in your experiments. Moving on to the topic of dimensional analysis. So every basic physical quantity that is measurable, it is represented in terms of the base quantities by a specific symbol, which uh, is written in square brackets. And that is called as the dimension of the physical quantity. Now these dimensions are helpful to derive the formulae and to check the homogeneity of your physical equation. Let's solve this problem. We have given that the energy of a photon of light of frequency f is given by hf, where h is the Planck's constant. We are required to find the base units of h. So we know that E is equal to hf, and we know what is f is simply 1 over t. So the units for this are one over second and the units for energy is joules seconds sorry uh, there is no second over here right we have joules and then how do you compute energy right so you know you can compute it by force times distance so the units for force is kilograms meters per second squared times the unit for distance d is meters so the units for force in base units are simply kilograms meters squared per second squared uh, and this distance so the the units for energy right so the units for energy are kilogram meter squared per second squared now Let's put the units uh, in this expression over here. So we have E, right? And uh, well, let's factor it out for H. So E over F is equal to H. So let's put in the units for E, which are kilograms meter squared per second squared, and then divide it by the units for frequency, which is one over second. So I can write it as second. So this S goes with the square on this second square and you get kilograms meter squared per second. So these are the units for H, which is the Planck's constant.